Welcome to the Demystify Technology Podcast from the Farm Group. Typically, you, you go through the due diligence process. What's the world of private equity? <laughs> right. Demystify it. McLaurin Group was a proud gold sponsor at this year's ACG Richmond Capital Conference. While there, we hosted a series of short conversations with experts in the private equity space to discover their outlook in areas of excitement as they look toward the coming year. In this episode, Alan Williamson interviews Jack Surma of Tecum Capital, a PE fund prescribing mezzanine debt, minority equity, and control equity, named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 50 founder-friendly private equity firms. Amidst a highly competitive market for deal sponsors, Jack describes the relationship-focused capital provider mentality as first institutional capital in a deal, and differentiation as a longtime partner. Good morning. Here we are at the Jefferson ACG Conference 2019, and we have a special guest, Jack Sarum, with us, Tecum Capital. Good morning, Alan. How are you? I'm doing good. I hear you guys don't hang about. Two deals yesterday? Yeah, so in one, out one, and then a drive to Richmond, Virginia from Pittsburgh. So uh, wow. no rest for the weary. And we've still got Thursday, Friday to go after this week. So exactly. who knows what's going to happen I got this a week? lot to follow up. That's right. <laughs> so... Tell us a little bit about Tecum Capital and what you've been doing. Sure, Alan. So Tecum Capital is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we provide junior capital in the form of mezzanine debt and minority equity out of our SBIC funds and then control equity out of our family office vehicle, Tecum Equity. So you, you have two arms there, effectively. So, so what would you say is your sweet spot of investments? What, what is your ideal investment that says this needs to be part of the Tecum family? Sure. So when I wake up to get out of bed in the morning, for our SBIC fund, which is really our bread and butter, a 10 to $15 million check, about 80% MES, 20% equity behind an independent sponsor that has some strong operational background, brings a couple dollars of his or her own to the table, that element of community and culture to the deal. That's really what we look for on the SBIC. And then out of the equity fund, long-term hold dynamics uh, is the name of the game. And what sort of verticals are your uh, particular strengths? So we're generalists. We will look to business services, industrials. Our favorite term is kind of rusty, dusty, off the beaten path type deals. Uh, we will look at some higher tech deals as well. We're not scared. We like to joke that we enter a deal kind of as pre-K. And we have to leave with a GED. So we have to be able to understand and explain, not necessarily be experts. But we'll look at everything under the sun, save for kind of the early stage venture real estate type of stuff. So typically, is your investments the first time that a founder or a company is coming into this space? We love it when it is that way. It doesn't necessarily always have to be that way, especially out of our family office on the equity side. We have a unique story to tell where family business has been closely held for a long time and they don't want to release it to private equity. They would rather pass the reins to another long-term hold owner. So we really do enjoy being the first institutional capital in a deal, but it's certainly not always the case. Got it. So you talk about lo- holding it for long, and as, as we look out on the landscape, we're seeing that deals are uh, no longer price-driven at this precise moment. It's about finding that right partner. So where do you guys differentiate yourselves to know that this is indeed the long-term partnership you should come into? Yeah, so it's, and, and I'll shift to, to talk a little bit more about the SBIC there because they're are so many sponsors out there looking for these deals and competing for these deals and it is it is hard for them to differentiate themselves to the sellers and it's hard for people like myself to differentiate our fund to the folks that wind up winning the deal so there is the relationship focused capital provider mentality is no joke it is a drum that we beat all the time we're good partners through both good times and bad times which is easy to say but hard to do and we've demonstrated i think the the best endorsement of that is we have over 15 previous CEOs that have invested in our funds. So that if that doesn't speak volumes, I'm not sure what will. Absolutely. So speaking of CEOs, what makes a good CEO for a Tecum portfolio? That's a really interesting question. And most of our CEOs are different. They need to be able to weather the storm of a leveraged balance sheet. That's one of the key things that I look for in evaluating a CEO in tandem with the deal is how much experience do they have with debt service and being able to kind of juggle that along with the needs of a business and how is investment and working capital going to affect our P&L as well as cash flow and, and 
managing all those different priorities for the overall success of the business versus your EVP of sales that has kind of the top line in mind or your uh, folks who have the SG&A or, or gross margin line in mind, having somebody that can focus on the whole picture is really important. Right. So with your newly acquired portfolios, are the CEOs typically ones that are looking to step off and have an exit or are they looking to be part of the continued story? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of a mixed bag. Some will want to pass the torch to their kind of second level management team that they've been grooming and some want to remain involved. We, we love some element of retained ownership or rollover so that there's still skin in the game and we have somebody to pick up the red phone and call uh, if we run into a situation that we weren't expecting. So a majority of our deals are something like that, where the, the founder or owner or CEO will stay involved. We certainly do deals where we'll have to kind of address the leadership post-close as well. Got it, got it. So I'm sure you see an awful lot of decks and pitch books, etc. But what is the sort of the, the common theme that you're seeing through, particularly in, in this day and age? I'm glad you brought that up, Alan, because Teague will see over 1,200 deals this this year, wow. and we're uh, we're pretty proud. Well, you closed two today this that's week, right, so yeah. I mean, you mean that's, you got to uh, put the volume in. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's got to come from somewhere. That's right. You, you'll see myself and my colleagues all over the ACG circuit, from Dallas to Minneapolis to Florida and and Manhattan and everywhere. But we'll see 1,200 deals, and there's all sorts of themes across them, but. The most common one is investment bankers like to make everything look better than it really well, is. Of course, the realtors, <laughs> and, aren't they? <laughs> and, uh, it's a doer upper at least. That's, that's, that's not a shot at, at all of my investment banker friends out there, but we kind of view our job as private equity investors, as professional questions askers. And nine times out of 10, the company has the information to get to us. And sometimes it's not in the book, sometimes it is. But if you ask for it, you're going to get it and you can synthesize it. So usually it's a pretty rosy picture. You just got to peel back the onion on all of them and, and ask the right questions. And, and speaking of the right questions, what, what is the sort of the red flag that you see in some of these 1,200 pitch books that you think, ooh, okay, that's, that's not for us? Obviously, the, the biggest impact to a deal at that stage of reviewing the sim, going to a management presentation, making a final bid, closing a deal is the EBITDA number, right? Adjustments to that EBITDA number are front and foremost in our mind when we're going through that because... We don't know the business as well as the person that has run the business Mm -hmm. for the last five to 10 years or however long. So verifying those adjustments and saying this is real EBITDA or fake EBITDA and what those pro formas will look like, that is kind of the number one A thing. And usually we can identify upfront the ones that are questionable. And then we rely on our service provider partners to kind of help dig in and verify some of the nuts and bolts when it gets to that stage as well. Got it. So if something's just not passing the sniff test with regard to what you've historically felt in an industry that you, you, you pretty much know well, then that, that's a sort of a... In certain industries where you'll see the same type of ad back and it's accepted sort of as market to get some kind of credit. And then there's some where you see and these guys are just swinging for the fences to see who they can get to bite on this. And if they can, good on you and, and best of luck, but not for us. Brilliant. So... You're, you're not involved in startups, you're, not, you're, you're private equity, so you're, you're the classic sort of uh, long-term business, etc. What is that story that you're looking for and, and how can a founder share that with you to be able to say, yeah, that, that's Tekken material? Well, I guess the first thing I want to mention as far as founders and thinking about Tekken is that this year we won an award from Inc. Magazine as being one of the top founder, entrepreneur-friendly private equity firms in the country. And that was, thank you very much, a, a huge accomplishment we think for the fund and for the firm so you're doing something right Uh, so what is it you're doing right i think it's our it's our speed to respond to the needs of our sponsor partners as well as management teams and it's a whole group and it's not just the, the capital provider to the sponsor relationship we really make an effort to dig in early on deals to understand the business so that we can ask valuable questions to the management team as well as kind of the nuts and bolts financial questions and i think that really shows well when you're able to learn the key pieces of the business, ask really good questions. You, you, we're not going to know everything walking into a deal, but by asking good questions, you're showing somebody that you're interested mm-hmm. and you want to learn more. I, I think that is really the key thing is, is speed and kind of elbow grease on learning different industries, different businesses, getting up to speed quickly. Brilliant. So as we look at the end of, of an investment, etc., what outside of returning a, a bag of money to the investors ultimately what we're in for. What is a successful exit? A successful exit for TECUM and the SBIC, one of our measures by the SBA is job growth. And I think 
for the most part, an increase in top and bottom line on the three statement financials, generally speaking, is, is aligned with job growth. So we obviously look at the financial metrics, but from a, a small business administration and SBIC perspective, we really look at job growth as well. And on the, the equity side, our fund there is relatively young, having launched in April of 2017. And candidly, we don't plan on having a lot or any auction process, general market exits of the three, four, five, six, seven right. year hold mm-hmm. period. So success there, I think, looks to us as a stable management team, growing cash flows and doing the right thing and, and growing the business at a conservative rate that's sustainable over the, the long term. And finding that next wave of CEOs that are going to continue on with the... Yeah, the, the labor market, I'm sure everybody you're, you're talking to is thinking, and if they haven't said it, that it's hard to find good people out there, whether you're trying to hire a, a shop foreman or a long haul truck driver or a, a controller, a CEO, CFO, whoever it is, it's hard to find good help right now. And that's always a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, we're seeing that too. Uh, a lot of people look great on paper, but <laughs> day in the job and yep. help. And great. passing the airport test, you got to like who you're working with. And I won't say the, the, the famous test, but most people probably know what I'm talking about. Yes. Jack, thank you very much for taking the time out. I know it's going to be a busy day for you. And uh, given how fast your week has started, who knows what's going to end uh, come Friday night? I'm looking forward to see what happens, Alan. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have made my media debut here. And I'll uh, let my agent know if anybody calls. Oh, we, we will we will field the calls for you. Have no fear in that, Jack. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan.